Yeah, we've been, we have four kids, and we've been working as Bible translators in Papua New Guinea since 1988. That's when we went there for the first time. And um, um, we work for a people called the Dawala, and there's about 3,000 speakers of those um, in, in the southern mountains of Papua New Guinea. It's a very, very remote place. You can only get there by helicopter. The older folks, they still remember the days of cannibalism, and we still have caves filled with skulls in our area. They were, they're animists. That means they, they worship bush spirits and ancestor spirits. These people, they, got, they were missionized, I want to say. Not, not evangelized, but Christianized, so to speak. And then they had a very weird way, a, a weird version of the gospel. It was, it's called the cargo cult. And it's widely spread in Melanesia. And uh, I think I can have time to tell the short story to say how it goes. The cargo cult is something, is a, a misunderstood gospel mixed up with Melanesian legends and mythology. And what it basically says is Jesus Christ was born in Papua New Guinea in a, at a place called Bethlehem, but that's just a cover name for the real place, which is a village in Papua New Guinea. He grew up, he did a lot of good things, he helped people, he healed them, and he gave them food. But one day he was killed by accident, and uh, then he went underground for three days. And he was traveling underground. Don't ask me how, but that's how the story goes. And from time to time, he would poke out his head out of the ground and look around <laughs> to, see, to see if his enemies were, were still there or if, the, or if the air is clear. Well, if it wasn't good to come up, he went down again and did some more traveling. But everywhere where he poked up his head, that's where today we have the springs. So the living water is what, what comes from that. Um, after three days, he rose again, and he was piping mad at the people for killing him for no reason. So he deserted them, and he went to a place called Paradise. And Paradise is the world of the white man, which is, uh, well, it's, it's America, uh, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. And it's all one place in their minds. It's, it's one local physical place. And so he went to Paradise, and there he gave the people the good news, the gospel, which is how to get cargo. And so it follows that nowadays all the white, the white people, we, have all the nice stuff, like cars and planes and TVs and whatnot, and the Papua New Guineans have nothing. But one day Jesus Christ will come back in power and glory and give them a lot of cargo. So that was the cargo cult. Anyways, um, so we were invited to come there to straighten that out and translate the Bible. And... We had an incredible introduction, and the very first morning, the witch doctor, of the, the main witch doctor, they have several, they have a hierarchy there, and the big guy, he showed up on our doorstep. We had a, a little a bush hut, um, grass hut, where we lived in, and he could speak a little bit of English, so I was quite surprised, and he had two apostles with him, he called them, and he said, he's here to test me with a bush knife. A bush knife is a machete, about that long, and... Uh, I said, well, I, I'd rather forgo the testing. But he insisted. He insisted, and um, I didn't know what to do. So he started acting very strange and wielding the bush knife, always sort of pretending to hit me, or I don't know if he really tried, and he just didn't. But I prayed, and, and he, started, um, he started yelling in a, uh, in, in a language. And, he, and I said, um, what, what's going on? And he says, well... The invisible man is, is going to wield the bush knife, and he's going to test you. And I say, what, what do you mean, invisible man? He says, well, I have an invisible man with me all the time. He helps me to do my, my magic, and he will wield the bush knife, and he will talk to you. So it occurred to me this was some kind of uh, a demon possession. And at that moment, I said, I don't know, it just came to me to say, oh, that's interesting. I have an invisible man, too. He's right next to me all the time, and he helps me, too. His name's Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe. And when I said that, something amazing happened. It's, it's just the same story as in the gospel when Jesus said, it's me, and they fell back. The guy fell over. He was, like, pushed back, and he stumbled and started yelling at the top of his lungs. And I, I called him back, and I said, what, what are you saying? And he said, I don't know. The invisible man said that. And so he started his test, uh, wielding this bush knife at me. And after a while, he stopped, and he came up to me and said, okay, I know now, I have to call you my Lord. And then he disappeared. And 
I don't know if he said that to me or if he said that to the Lord who was with me, but that's what he said. And then he went, he went away. And the people witnessed that. And they were extremely impressed. They thought uh, something's different with us, that this guy reacted to us in such a way. And anyway, so we started translating the Bible, and they were very helpful uh, f from, the, from the beginning. And the cargo cult, as, they tra as we translated, I didn't go preaching every day, but just as we translated, the people woke up and said, wow, the cargo cult's not right. I said, yeah, you got it. <laughs> and uh, and it, it completely disappeared in our area. Well, it's still around on the outskirts, but in our village and neighboring villages, it's completely gone. And when we t dedicated the New Testament uh, a couple of years ago, lots of things happened. The Lord showed his power in, in, in many different ways in those years that we've been there. And I, I could go on telling story after story like that of, of what the Lord has done. But when we had the dedication, um, there were representatives from each village, from the, from the witch doctors, and they all came forward and they said, on this day, we want to start something new in our life. We want to have that God of power in our life who gives us reason to live, and we want to get rid of all, these, all, these, uh, all this magic and this worshiping of spirits. And they brought all their, uh, their magical items, not books, but it reminded me of the story in Acts, you know, in uh, Acts 19, where they burned all those books. And uh, they burned their stuff that they used to do witchcraft and sorcery on an, on an altar and, and publicly announced that now they're going to follow Christ only. And that was, that was amazing. It was a surreal moment for us. One of the reasons, I often ask myself, why are the Dawahs so accepting of God and why are they so open? Because we've been doing ministry and evangelism all our life. I mean, my wife and I, we started back when we were teenagers. We were out on the streets doing street evangelism and we smuggled Bibles into Russia and all those things. We often had, we often, and often had the, the, the impression people aren't interested. And... Uh, they couldn't care less of what we had to say. And I found out that people aren't ready necessarily to receive the gospel. We were telling them Jesus loves them, but that doesn't matter. They say, well, so does my dog. And uh, it doesn't mean much. Yeah, if, you don't, if you hang the gospel somehow in a vacuum, it doesn't mean much. They have to know why the gospel is there and what, the, what it frees them from and what, it opens, what possibilities it opens to them. Well, the Dao has had that. And that's why they were so receptive. And it came when we started to translate the word for God. God is always a critical word in translation because you never know what are you going to use. Going to use the English word or some of the local words. Well, we had a local word that we used, and it came from a legend. And the legend goes like this. Uh, in the beginning, there was Mamai Tsua. Mamai Tsua is a compound word of Mamai and Tsua, which means birth-giving daddy. Not father, but it's the word for daddy. It's a very strange word, and it's, it's the highest and most powerful being in, in Dawa mythology, and it's the only being that is absolutely just and, and correct and good, and it's the being who made and created everything. And all the attributes of this Mamaitsua match exactly up with, with the God of the Bible. And uh, so the story goes that Mamaitsua made everything in the beginning. He made the world, and he made two people. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and he made a tree. And he planted the tree in the world, and the two people, and the tree, there was a, a, a rope hanging down from heaven that ended in that tree. And when the people wanted to connect with God, they would climb into the tree and then shimmy up the rope and be with God. And everything was good. At that time, there was no death or decay or sickness. There was always enough food. It was paradise. Well, one day, the two, the two people did something wrong, and God was very angry, and he cut the rope. Mamaitsua cut the rope. And from that day on, death entered the world, decay, anger, everything evil. And so the problem was that people could not reconnect to Mamaitsua anymore because he was the one who cut the rope. That's what, that meant he's the only one who was able to restore that rope or to restore that relationship again. You couldn't restore it with magic, what they did with other spirits. So when we... Uh, heard of that, we tried to tell that, you know, use that word Mamaitsua and introduce Jesus as Mamaitsua's son and suddenly a whole world opened for them. And they, this is the way back to Mamaitsua. And they were so ready to just accept that after we, we had made that connection and it worked very well. I went back to Papua New Guinea just for six weeks to helping them on translation in the Old Testament. 
And, I, and uh, they were asking me and said, well, um, how are we going to print this? So we were talking about printing the Old, the Old Testament stuff that we translated. And by the way, they said, can you also print some more New Testaments for us? And I said, what do you mean? We still have tons of boxes sitting in our house in the village, and there's more at the center. I said, no, no, they're all sold out. And people are starting to copy them already and everything. And I said, what's going on? And they said, everything is sold out. The people are crazy about the New Testament. And little church groups and Bible studies have started in every hamlet and village. Because they, w- they, they heard of what we had done, and they, they found out that from other Christians now that this book is the way to, to show them the way back to restore that relationship with Mama Itzua. You can pray for the Dawa people. There's something great going on there. They're very... Uh, very simple in their faith, but um, God is doing a lot of great things and really glorifying his name over there in Papua New Guinea.